Welcome to series Symposium 2020. My name is Bai Jian Yang, and I also go by Justin. In this short video presentation, I would like to introduce Purdue Read Plus project on managing CUI. So before we talk about this project, let's look at what some of the regulated research in general. And we're using Purdue as example to show why do we need a framework to help us manage CUI. So if you look at the life of researchers, it turns out a lot of data they work on are either being regulated or have some sensitive information. So there are multiple front doors they have to fight and the, the, the entire con, uh, contracting workflow can be com complex. So they have to work with security analysts, making sure that everything are safe and very well protected. But the security analysts are often buried in all different kinds of reviews. And to make this project going, you have to get the pre-awards and the sponsor office get involved. But in many cases, uh, the staff at pre-award, they are not really trained for uh, security uh, in general. So, so they have to gain some sort of training for potential regulations. And likewise, some of the research have uh, a human subject in its nature or animal sciences. So you have to pass the IRB approval before you can conduct those kind of researches. And IRB staff, they may or may not have the right information to protect the, um, uh, those controlled research sensitive data. So that's another battle you have to um, get over with. In addition to this, if you're looking at a today's computing infrastructure, how could you expect in this large campus environment, everything is running in this distributed fashion that all the staff are familiar with this process. So you have this big hurdle you have to fight and that involves more than just the researchers, more than just computer, uh, more than just the uh, campus IT. So with many different uh, stakeholders over here. Now, if we have to pick someone's view, let's focus on PI, okay? So PI's life, as many of you are aware, are kind of uh, interesting. You work really, really hard to uh, making your proposals ranked as top 2% so that you can get your proposal funded. Now, that's only half of the battle because once you get a uh, project funded, you actually have to work even harder to complete work. So when you focus your time and energy at working on your research project, and then you soon realize there's so many things you also have to take care of. You need to talk to the contracts in the grants office. You need to talk to the sponsor's office. And you have to make sure all the data and the products meet the regulation uh, requirements. And you most likely are going to work with the IT department. And uh, here at Purdue, you're probably going to uh, touch with the research computing uh, branches at ITAP to making sure that those high performance computings are in place to support your computation need. And you also have to talk to the security offices, making sure everything is safe. And if there are any export control issue, making sure you're also hitting all those regulations as well. So when you are busy working with your project, you realize you have to spend that much time just trying to making sure that everything is nice and safe. It just feels too much. And this is just from the view of PI. And you can, you can easily tweak this graph and change it from the view of the contract offices, from the sponsor office, and from IT or research computing. You're basically getting very similar results. Everybody is working on multi-different systems, working with multiple different projects, and everybody's kind of getting lost in this kind of uh, very complex model. So what we uh, finally was able to do was uh, we're getting the support from NSF, and we try to solve this kind of problem by building a framework that might be able to share it from the, um, for the entire uh, campus research computing environment. We're looking at uh, three different populations here. The first thing is uh, looking at researchers because they are the drivers to make the research moving forward. So we need to provide them with the enough uh, education res and the resource available to support them, making sure that they can have more time focusing on their research without worrying too much about securities and controls and all that. The second thing is, is we want this framework 
to be able to empower campus IT so that uh, it can meet regulation requirements and uh, simplify this, uh, um, streamline the entire process. And the third thing is we want to improve these processes for the research administration. So for higher education, we want to have always have a, a different kind of process for different things. So are there any a single process of tech intake that can help us managing this research project uh, nicely with everything included? So this is something we're looking for. Those are the three major items we're hoping to provide with this framework. And when we're building this framework, right now it's a three-year project. Somebody has to work on this. And we thought, why don't we invite our graduate students and undergraduate students to work with us? So during this process, we kind of cultivate some of the future cyber infrastructure experts or cybersecurity experts. And our deliverables hopefully are also break into three categories. The researchers, we assume they are most likely the data owners. They collect the data, they generate data. So we're hoping to provide them with the guidelines training documents, videos, and we're also intended to uh, do a pre-test and post that and see uh, how this uh, Read Plus framework uh, change their life when it comes to security uh, compliance. And for IT department, our view is they're most likely the data custodians. There are so many security controls you have to into put into place. So how does it impact in terms of uh, your, your IT infrastructure management, how does it impact with incident reporting, data classification, storage uh, support, how does it impact your cost model, and how does it impact your cybersecurity and maturity uh, certification. So all those things, we're hoping to address those in this uh, REPLUS framework. And likewise, for the university administrations, what is gonna be your um, governance model do you have like an intake flowchart? And uh, how do you actually act, uh, a, a assess data handling? And do you have any kind of data user agreements? So on and so forth. So we break our project into those uh, three major components. Each component targeting one group of people in the campus computing environment. And our hope is this project not only brings success to Purdue environment, but we're also hoping we have this uh, uh, framework that can be used for CUI for the entire higher education community. So some of the things that I want to highlight in this uh, uh, short video presentations are one of the things we have done uh, is try to define a common language. So this is a very, very important when you're working on a distributed environment. So in this uh, a common language, we define data based on their security level. So going from unclassified to classified, we have level two, three, and four, and each level is built on top of the previous level. The read plus ecosystem really hitting on the level three and the level four uh, in this common language architecture. So once you define the security level, you're providing the different kind of uh, examples. So everybody on board kind of understand what you're talking about, whether this data is level three or level four. And go from there, you decide what kind of data storage you're gonna, you're gonna uh, use and what kind of network support you should be uh, in place, what kind of uh, uh, security uh, control should be implemented to meet the regulation requirements. So once the common languages are defined, the next thing you can do is you can go from there, implement a different solutions for different type of research. For example, if you are working on the basic research, uh, your access control is most likely open access and you can feel free to use community cluster and uh, uh, regular uh, storage, cloud storage. But if your data has some of the sensitive information in there, you have to put the security in place. You might have to implement firewall rules and you, you probably cannot really run this community clusters, but instead you want to make sure that there are some management in place or some of the controlled uh, storage being used for to support your project. So each different level have a additional security control in, put into place to making sure all the regulation needs are uh, met. And this layered approach and the combination uh, and the common language really help the uh, IT, um, IT staff 
be able to support different type of uh, uh, projects and also make the PIs have a better understanding of what type of uh, information they should use. And because it's a, a common language, it's such a nice way to bring everybody on board. Right now here at Purdue, this particular uh, framework's language and, ver uh, and vision uh, has already reached the board of trustees. So hopefully it can be approved and become using the common language here at Purdue. Now from the governance point of view, um, the entire Purdue infrastructure is, uh, first of all, is lead under the uh, leadership of uh, executive vice president for research and CIO. So going from there, they provide an overs uh, oversight for uh, the research projects and the various stakeholders, like the program, me uh, program me uh, members and the research computing operations. And going from there, everybody try to work um, as a whole but in general, we do have this kind of nice hierarchy to help us governing the data and the project. You, you, in this process, it is very important that you create a, uh, a CUI process, this kind of map, if you will, so that you can provide this consistent view for everybody so they know what's going on at different stages of your project. For example, if you're looking at the PI, if we center our a framework from the PI's perspective, and you break your project from initialization, planning, plan, uh, preparation, execution, and closing, we can, you know, um, looking at this from different perspective from PI, sponsor office, expert control, and IT, and we're going to map up all the necessary components and put into this uh, process map. By having a overreach, uh, overview of the map, everybody is aware of what are different pieces in there whether something has been done. So by uh, creating the CUI processes, this is something I, uh, we believe are very beneficial for everybody to managing um, the um, CUI projects. So certainly there are a lot more things I can talk about, um, but due to time, I just wanna quickly wrap up here. Our team, including myself and uh, Preston Smith and uh, uh, Carolyn Ellis from I Research Computing and ITAP, the um, driving forces of uh, our team, including Eric Adams and Sean, Web Sean Bass, they're doing a lot of heavy lifting, uh, making the back end working um, in the research computing environment. And this project also get the support from many different graduate students and undergraduate students. We thank them for uh, putting a lot of effort into this project. So finally, a very quick thank you. And if you want to know more about this project, we do have a, a link over there. Uh, it's www.rarc.purdue.edu slash services slash read plus. So you can go from there to find more information. So hopefully this short video really helps you understand the Purdue's effort to help manage controlled unclassified information in the research computing environment. So that's the end of this short video. I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, symposium. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jianliang Wu. Today, I'm going to present, present Blisa spoofing attacks against reconnections in Bluetooth Low Energy. This is a joint work with Yu Hong, Wei Rashba, Dave, Antonio, Matthias, and Dongye. BLE was introduced in 2011. It's mainly designed for power constrained devices, such as smart home devices, for example, a smart temperature sensor, and healthcare devices, like a smart glucose monitor. The number of BLE devices grows rapidly in recent years. According to Bluetooth SIG, there will be over 5 billion BLE devices shipped in 2023. Given the popularity of BLE devices, the security is more important. But BLE is not secure. There are some prior attacks target the pairing procedure when two devices first connect or target at the unpaired devices. Some other prior attacks need additional assistance, such as a malicious app, to launch at the attack. However, Reconnection procedure in BLE after the first connection is unexplored. 
In our paper, we focus on the following scenario. These two devices are first connected and paired, and then one device moves out of the Bluetooth range, and the connection is disconnected. After a while, this device moves back and it intends to connect it to a previously paired device. So in our work, we formally analyze the BLE reconnection procedure and identified two weaknesses. Based on these two weaknesses, we propose BLE spoofing attacks that can attack paired devices without additional assistance, such as a malicious app. And we evaluate our attack on real-world BLE devices, and it can affect more than 1 billion BLE devices in real-world. We build the model and verify the model using pre-verif, and we verify three types of security properties, confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. The details of our formal analysis can be found in our paper. Through our analysis, we identified two weaknesses. The first one is, in some cases, the authentication can, is optional. The second one is that, uh, in some other cases, the authentication can be circumvented. There are two types of authentication procedure defined in the specification, reactive and proactive authentication. Our analysis shows that there's a design issue in reactive authentication so that the, it can be bypassed. And if the implementation of proactive authentication does not strictly follow the specification, it can also be bypassed. Based on this weakness, we propose BLE spoofing attacks that can attack paired devices without additional assistance. We evaluate Blazor in real-world real devices by answering these two questions. Which procedure is used by the mainstream BLE stacks and whether the procedure is vulnerable to Blazor? We analyze the four BLE stack implementations on different operating systems, including Linux, Android, iOS, and Windows. And we found that only Windows is immune to Lisa because it uses the proactive authentication procedure and strictly follows the specification. Both Android and iOS use the proactive authentication, but it, they have the implementation vulnerability, and therefore they are vulnerable to Lisa. Linux, which uses Bluezy as the BLE stack, use the reactive authentication procedure, and uh, of course, it's vulnerable to Blisa. Our evaluation and prior research show that Blisa can affect at least 8,000 BLE apps, and we believe similar number may also apply to iOS. It can also affect even more than 1 billion BLE devices. Our findings are also covered in an article published on Security Boulevard. We responsibly disclosed our findings to Apple. Apple acknowledged our findings and assigned a CV number to the vulnerability. We also reported our findings to Google on April 8th, and we received the following response. The believe is duplicate of a report submitted three days earlier than us. To sum up, we carried, out a, we carried out a formal analysis of the unexplored BLE reconnection procedure and identified two weaknesses. We proposed Blisa, which can attack paired BLE devices based on these weaknesses, and evaluation Blisa on real-world BLE devices. That's all for my presentation. Sam, thank you, and I am glad to take questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Jimmy Kosis. I'm an assistant professor from the Department of Computer and Information Technology. Today, I would like to present some of our work in cyber physical social system design for secure and critical infrastructures. 
in recent years due to the advances in computing sensing and networking. Cyber components have been tightly coupled with the physical components in different critical infrastructures, such as smart manufacturing, smart grids, and intelligent transportation systems. Those tight integrations between the cyber and physical components have dramatically improved the effectiveness and the efficiency of the critical infrastructures. However, at the same time, they also introduce a series of unfamiliar attack surfaces, which results in the increasing vulnerability to the cyber attacks and the physical failures. Different solutions have been provided for addressing those problems. Those solutions are effective under the assumption given by the researchers. However, there still remain some essential challenges for securing the cyber physical critical infrastructures. This has been demonstrated by the sophisticated cyber attacks launched in Ukraine power systems in 2015 and 2016. For long term goal, we aim to paving the way for achieving an intelligent and secure modern cyber-physical critical infrastructures. Currently, we focus on three research directions. First, developing an intelligent detection mechanism on cyber attacks and physical failures. Second, designing attack-resilient communication infrastructures. Last, developing a bio-inspired intelligent decision-making and control systems. Next, I will introduce these three directions in more details. First, intelligent detection on cyber attacks and the physical failures. Machine learning technologies has been widely applied for securing critical infrastructures and uh, provided promising solutions. However, there still remain some essential challenges for directly applying those machine learning techniques in the critical infrastructure operations. At least uh, some of the essential challenges as following. For example, in some scenarios, the available valuable data can be very limited. And in many practical situations, those uh, available data are very sparsely labeled. At last, there are more and more concerns about the security of the machine learning techniques. For addressing those essential challenges, we provide the following two solutions. First, for addressing the challenge in scarcity, of labeled data, we proposed a hybrid weak supervision based method by exploiting the human domain knowledge. The overview of the structure is shown as following. Our proposed hybrid weak supervision based computing method consists of three main learning models, primary learning model, secondary learning model, and latent feature learning model. Primary learning model is designed to extract the features presented by the labeled data. Secondary learning model is designed to interact with the primary learning model and to extract the feature presented by the unlabeled data, which are consistent with the ones presented by the labeled data. And latent feature learning model is designed to interact with the primary and the secondary learning model and to integrate the properties and the dynamics mechanism of the system characterized by the domain knowledge with the features presented by the data. In other words, the design of the latent feature learning model is to seamlessly integrating the features presented by the domain knowledge and the ones presented by data. By doing so, we are able to achieve a high accuracy in prediction and detection even the available data are very sparsely labeled. We have evaluated the performance of our method in a power system scenario. In this scenario, um, a power outage occurs and we aim to detect the location of the power outage. We compare the performance of our method with an existing weak supervision method mean teacher, and the results is uh, shown in this table. We can see when there are at least 5% of the data are labeled, our method achieves comparable performance compared with the mean teacher method. However, when the sparsity of the labeling is very high, for example, there's only 1.25% of the data labeled, our method outperforms the mean teacher method by increasing the accuracy by nine, about 9%. For addressing the challenges in lack of available data and security and machine learning, we propose a blockchain-based decentralized and secure situation awareness system 
and the overview of the syst uh, computing system is shown as the following. So the main idea is that we try to develop a secure and decentralized computing infrastructure to enable the effective collaboration amongst the individual decentralized computing nodes, even they have very limited computing power, computing intelligence, even though even they are untrustworthy to each other. So through this kind of effective collaboration among those decentralized computing nodes, we're able to achieve an effective crowd-sourced situational awareness system for securing the critical infrastructures. And those computing nodes can participate in these uh, computing systems by playing one of the three roles, application initiator, computing contributors, or the verification contrib contributors. The application initiator will start this uh, data-driven situational awareness system by clarifying the associated information such as the objective and the constraints of the task via the blockchain smart contract and uh, submitting the training and testing data set to the decentralized storage systems. And uh, the computing contributors will participate in this uh, task by training their private model locally by using their local available data or the data shared by the application initiator according to the objective and the constraints of the task given by the application initiator via the blockchain smart contract. And uh, after they train, they finish training the private model, they will claim their accomplishment while the blockchain powered computing systems. And then the verification contributors will be randomly selected to verify the value of the claimed private models by conducting the quantitative verification mechanism locally. If the majority of the verification contributors claim conclude that the claimed private models are valuable, the transaction between the application initiator and the associated computing contributors will be established. After achieving this or receiving those the private models, the application initiator will implement the proposed multimodal data fusion method multimodal learning fusion method in order to achieve a metal model to solve their data-driven situational awareness problem. And because this task is funded by a NASA project, we evaluate this uh, proposed and um, decentralized secure situation awareness system by developing a hardware in the loop prototype and uh, evaluate the performance in a NASA deep space exploration scenario. We compare the performance with the existing decentralized learning method, federated learning, and uh, as shown in this, uh, this uh, plot, we can see our method outperformed the federated learning method from the perspective of time consumption. Furthermore, from this uh, the plot, we can also see our in our computing method, the communication overhead introduced by the blockchain technology is neglectable. However, the blockchain platform can provide a uh, um, very critical in integrity security solutions. Therefore, the, our blockchain technology is reasonable to be used in our computing infrastructure. So the second task, the attack resilient communication infrastructure, this task is aimed to address the challenge that for um, operate, for the operations in the critical infrastructures, there are tremendous amount of sensing and operating data need to be delivered with different quality of service or called QoS for short requirements for the different operating conditions. However, this cannot be always granted for the conventional communication infrastructure because those infrastructure were originally not established for this purpose. So in order to address this challenge in one DOE project, we worked together with the National Renewable Energy Lab, NRO, by and to develop a low retrofitting cost solutions by leveraging the existing conventional communication infrastructures and designing a tag resilient networking middleware mechanism. The details is shown as the following. Our design, the middleware, 
instance is allocated between the networking infrastructure layer and the application layer. And this middle value will interact with the infrastructure layer by abstracting the multi-layer situational awareness through the QS criteria and also interact with the application layer by achieving the quality of experiences evaluation feedback. And the quality of experiences, or CalQE for short evaluation, will be used as the additional criteria together with the QoS criteria. And through QoS and QoE information from the multi-layer of the networking infrastructure, the middleware is able to achieve a cross-layer control decision-making for detecting the potential cyber attacks and physical failure and for adaptively optimizing the networking management. And uh, work together with um, Enroll, we also develop a hardware in the loop prototype and testing that in a large scale power system scenario, which has a high penetration LPV. In the last task about inspired intelligent decision making and the control system design, we try to answer two essential questions. First, how can we dynamically modeling the cyber physical system? Second, how should heterogeneous cyber physical components cooperate for securing the operations of the critical infrastructures? To answer this question, one of the solution we provide is uh, the flocking inspired multi-agent resilient control, which illustrated in these diagrams. The main idea is that we set up an uh, analogy between the complex dynamics of the be flocking behavior and uh, the complex interaction between the components in power system due to the cyber and the physical coupling and develop a flocking inspired inference model whose output is the expected value of the critical environments. Based on the difference between the expected and the true values of the critical environments, our proposed reinforcement learning based control mechanism will adaptively optimize the power system to enhance the resilience and the security. And uh, overall, our work um, have uh, three main dimension, directions, the intelligent direction, the intelligent detection on cyber attacks and physical failures, and attack resilient communication infrastructure, and the bio-inspired intelligent decision making and the control. I view this the relationship between these three directions as uh, the different part of the tree. The, Intelligent detection of cyber attacks and physical failures, like the leaf of the tree, because they are able to leverage interact with the data outside. And uh, the bio inspired intelligent decision making and the control mechanism, like the tree trunk, because they uh, interact with the physical system. And the, the connection between these two parts is the efficient and attack resilient communication infrastructures. Just like make the, um, if we want to keep the house of the tree, we have to maintain these three components at the same time, similarly, and in order to achieve a secure and intelligent critical infrastructure, we need to consider these three dimensions in a cohesive manner. Therefore, and we think these three components are very important for our research. So that's it. Thank you very much. So as, as all of these different ones came into play, um, we had a name change. Um, so, you know, as we went from network security, we probably went to maybe information security and then we, um, where we focused on previous hardware and software. Um, we didn't focus so much on manipulated data. Uh, then we went into uh, looking at uh, the CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that leaded more into information assurance, and that held, that stuck for quite a while. And then um, the pub, you know, the public didn't handle the um, information assurance. They didn't really know what that was, but boy, they really liked the word cybersecurity, and that stuck 
uh, and resonated well. So we've had the word cybersecurity around for a while, but now there's cyber resilience and other terms that are being coined out there. So we've, we've gone through quite a few iterations of the word uh, cybersecurity or information assurance or however you want to coin the term uh, securing uh, your computer systems, networks, and data, and devices, and et cetera, right? Um, and then we went into, so as all this was going on, of course, we had a workforce to uh, train and educate and, and all those dynamics. And so that changed as well. So as every new technology pops out, um, uh, universities had to try to keep up. So all this dynamic changes in the workforce affected how we educated and, and trained um, uh, the uh, universities, the um, uh, two year, four years, et cetera. So the faculty had to keep up with all those changing demands of the workforce. So there's constant tension um, with that static nature in academia and this dynamic uh, nature of cybersecurity. So we found that university structures tend to change slower and uh, it takes a lot of time to get all your administrative paperwork and oversight, et cetera, through. So this slow changing um, uh, can create barriers in preparing your um, uh, workforce, right, with the cat, you know, all the information that they need to keep up. And so you have employers that are craving for these uh, students to be prepared, um, and you're trying to get them trained as fast as you can. Additionally, um, we see that cybersecurity problems are systemic in nature. And so sometimes our courses tend to teach point solutions. So for example, we, te we tend to teach um, <laughs> reverse engineering, cryptography, um, pen testing, et cetera. And so we teach specific problems without looking at the entire system. So a cyber threat tends to operate in complex systems. So, our so the framework that we're introducing um, tends to look at it through a, um, helps design the curriculum and be flexible enough to respond to uh, rapid changes in the cybersecurity environment. So our curriculum, our framework can also be used across cybersecurity courses to help um, contextualize and try to help uh, with those specific courses in the complex nature of uh, cybersecurity systems. So we look now into the root of this, our, our framework, which is systems thinking. So the systems thinking uh, in higher education is, uh, we draw on systems thinking and we also draw on active learning strategies here. So if we look at what systems thinking entails, we look at inputs to a system, uh, the system itself and outputs. So we look at, um, we look at the overall systems thinking approach, um, like uh, uh, planning and uh, problem solving, it looks at like a variety of tools um, and looking at the whole picture or the big picture. So we look at, if you look at um, MITRE's um, uh, definition of systems thinking, it's the ability and practice of examining the whole rather than focusing on isolated problems. So when we look at the framework, uh, we see that it's useful in describing any system, right? So we can put any system in here and we know the inputs <laughs> and we know the necessary out, uh, system elements. So what we do is we put in the known inputs with the system elements 
And then we look at with a, a defined boundary, which you see at the boundary there. And then what we do is we get an output that is based on um, the system or process that is um, from a specific input. So then what we want to do is apply that to a framework for cybersecurity systems thinking. So what we look at here is we take the general um, systems thinking framework and what we want to do is in this example is describe a cybersecurity environment and this is an enterprise environment. So we put in some inputs and, and again they're not every input um, but there, there could be more here so this is our example and once you develop this the items in the framework could be used here uh, for us to be included in courses okay um, this example also demonstrates how a program um, graduate from this program can be attuned to systems thinking and approach various responsibilities right so they can look at this and and uh, while working in any kind of organization so they know how to look at at the picture, the whole picture, and not just one little piece. Having problems with my mouse here. And then we go on to look at cybersecurity education system with the general enterprise security, or the general system here. Um, so the context and approach to teaching systems thinking uh, is critical and the strategies we use to teach systems thinking uh, merit our attention as well. So when we look here we use this system framework uh, to describe the education program as a system. So we have our identified inputs and our, our desired outputs. So you see here we have the catalog um, inputs um, the uh, CAE uh, standards, crediting body standards, CSEC 2017, um, students, uh, research funding, et cetera. And then we want graduates, um, we want research papers, new courses, new curriculum, patents probably, and grant apps. Um, the people we have here are the board, academic, uh, department chairs, teacher students, staff, um, faculty and processes and tools. So these help um, for a given output, like let's say the funding grant, this model can help determine which people can use which tools in what process to generate the desired output. And so visualizing these options can assist in optimizing these resources. So the challenges, people, right? So there's a, careers in almost every industry will require understanding of both technologies and, and the underlying logic. Um, we need to train more, which means we gotta get them to think in a holistic manner. Um, and they have to be able to adapt to the ever-changing cyber landscape. So being able to think critically and problem solve and being able to think in systems is critical. Uh, workforce development, Workforce preparation, active learning approach, critical thinking, and systems thinking. Uh, as cybersecurity matures, broader and more resilient cybersecurity education needs to develop 
in pace. So we have to be able to keep pace. That's a difficult problem. Uh, we need to be able to provide cybersecurity students with rich learning opportunities that develop their systems thinking. Um, educators, uh, increasing challenges, funding, uh, uh, <laughs> learning. Uh, educators have to learn as well, and it's changing so fast. Uh, support students through their teaching. Create gaps that run the risk of, of inconsistent solutions. Uh, always happening. Um, uh, cybersecurity as a field must both mature and broaden. So we have to look at other disciplines, um, not just the technical ones for cybersecurity. And thank you very much.